Hi, good evening. I'm Steve McGraw. I'm the general manager for the San Mateo County Harbor District. We're here in the third public workshop uh, following our first public meeting on districting the Harbor District for the elections that begin in 2020 and 2022. Uh, we've hired a demographer. Our demographer is here this evening, Paul Mitchell of Redistricting Partners. He's going to give a presentation that will explain the process that we've been through to date and the draft maps that we've got. From here on out, we'll go from this to uh, another public meeting tomorrow night in El Granada at 6.30 at the district offices on Avenue Alhambra. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to a conversation with the Board of Commissioners uh, in, on September the 5th, again in El Granada. With that, I'd like to introduce Paul Mitchell of Redistricting Partners. Thank you very much. Uh, we've done a number of these presentations so far, so I'm going to go rather quickly through some of the basics. And then we have maps that are on the wall and on the website, so that if somebody wants to see the maps that have been proposed, they're more than welcome to do that. First off, districting is the is the process of creating areas from which each of the trustees will be elected. Their entire and only purpose is for the purpose of elections. It doesn't change any services that are provided. It doesn't have to do with anything in terms of the functions of the board. It simply has to do with how the board members are elected. Redistricting is often used synonymously. So sometimes people will talk this about this as a redistricting, however, Redistricting specifically speaks to the adjustment of lines every 10 years based on the U.S. Census. When most people think about redistricting, when most people think about redistricting, they think about this image. It's a political cartoon from uh, Governor Gary redrawing districts uh, in Massachusetts and a political cartoonist said it looked like a salamander, drew this, and it became called the gerrymander. This is an old-timey thing. People think of this as not being how we currently draw districts, but I always like to show this map, which is a, US, a state senate map in Los Angeles, Kevin DeLeon's state senate map he was elected under, and it does look awful lot like a gerrymander to me. The, uh, if you got to an advanced political science class, or you were in college and looked at gerrymandering, this is a kind of graphic that might come up to explain how gerrymandering can work to change uh, the outcomes of elections. And in this version, you have an area with a Democratic majority. And if you were to draw districts based on a kind of fair redistricting, you might find that you would draw three horizontal areas and now you have two Democratic districts and one Republican. However, if you were trying to create an advantage for Republicans in this area, you would make it look like this. You would have now two Republican districts and one Democratic district. Essentially, gerrymandering can be used to give advantages to some groups and cause disadvantages to others. However, in all the years I've done local redistricting, I have never seen anybody redistrict based on party for something like a water district or a school district or a, even a city council. What it generally has to come down to is communities of interest. And we'll get into what those are more, but you can imagine like a downtown area versus a rural area and how drawing districts could make one have greater voting power. When we draw districts, we do a number of things to try to remove the perverse kind of redistricting effects that would be considered gerrymandering. These are the five criteria that are kind of set by US Supreme Court decisions and by state and federal law that we'll use to make sure that we draw districts that are fair and evenly balanced. The first is, we're gonna draw districts that are equal size. What that means is that they are equal size in terms of the residents the raw population of each of those areas. We're not going to look just at voters or just at people over 18 or just citizens. We're going to look at everybody. Districts are going to be contiguous, meaning that they're whole parts. We're not going to have districts that 
appear in one part of the area and then kind of disappear and reappear somewhere else, they're going to be whole units. We're going to maintain communities of interest wherever we can find these. Communities of interest, the primary community of interest that we'll consider will be those that are covered by state and federal law, namely ethnic, religious minorities, race, and these protected classes. Beyond the protected classes, we're going to look at other communities of interest, and these communities of interest essentially are how a community views itself. They might think of themselves as being the hillside community. They might think of themselves as being the aerospace community. They might think of themselves as being the beachfront community, uh, the downtown, the, you know, sometimes even certain neighborhoods. I live in Midtown Sacramento in a neighborhood called Boulevard Park. And so when we're drawing districts in Sacramento, there's this big push to make sure Midtown stays together. <coughs> and a lot of work done to try to define what in the bejesus Midtown is and how that is described and how they, how they kind of are working together. So we're going to think about communities of interest, not just where they are geographically, but how they might be different for this agency than, say, for the county supervisors or then a school board or a community college district. We're going to try as much as we can to follow existing boundaries. And this is for two reasons. The primary reason is that a community of interest can be defined by the city that somebody lives in. A community of interest can be defined by the school district boundaries they live in. And oftentimes, those other geographic boundaries of local government have a meaning and a purpose that is, in a way, a definition of themselves as a community of interest. The second thing is that the state law in the redistricting for statewide redistricting, legislative, congressional lines, the state law says that they must follow city and county boundaries. And so the state is essentially staking a claim saying these are important. We don't have to follow every city and county line or every school board district line or water board line, but where those lines are available, if we're drawing districts that are equal size, contiguous, and maintaining communities of interest, maybe the fourth thing we look at is trying to follow those lines. The fifth criteria here, and they're not purely hierarchical, but they are kind of a little bit hierarchical, would be keeping districts compact. And a compact district in this kind of discussion is not necessarily a small district, but we're going to keep districts to be more circles and squares and less squiggly and serpentine. Again, we're not going to draw compact districts at the expense of communities of interest. We're not going to com draw compact districts at the expense of keeping them equal size. But we will think of all of these things as kind of a family of criteria we'll use to make sure that at the end of the day, we're not drawing districts for some other reason that is unassociated with these kind of good criteria. The California Voting Rights Act is the law under which we're acting to make this change. And that law essentially says you can't have an at-large election system if you have racially polarized voting. And that has been determined by the, sec the county supervisors to exist here. So it would make sense that it is also for the Harbor District. While the federal law uses a term called majority-minority to determine whether or not something has to be a districted system, meaning you have districts that are majority of one minority group, the state law simply says that we want to try, try to draw districts where communities can influence the outcome of an election. Um, the CVRA also has potential penalties, essentially, for noncompliance, which is that you can get sued and you can have a lot of legal fees associated with a lawsuit if you don't follow kind of this process of, that we're going through this process of good redistricting. When we, the reason, in addition, this is a little bit more about CVRA, but we are looking at um, trying to draw districts where the uh, creation of districts will allow the communities of interest or minority subgroups to influence the outcome of the election. When we look at the district as a whole, we're looking at about 780,000 individuals. 
and that is based on the 2010 census. If we're to break that into five districts, we're looking at around 145,000 people in each district. In fact, if we try to draw districts of relatively equal size, we're looking anywhere from 140 to 147,000 people in each district. You can just think, for ease, we're trying to draw districts around 145,000. If somebody wanted to propose lines, and they propose lines of a district that's 150,000 or 140,000, we could work with that and try to see how to massage it to get it within that criteria of being, you know, within that range. If we look just at cities, we'll see there's a number of cities in the district that could be used as kind of like building blocks for a districting plan. We also have a number of local census designated places, which are communities that you can say, like, I live from this area, but it doesn't have a city council, it doesn't have its own police force, it doesn't have its own fire department or something like that. But there are several areas, primarily in the more rural areas, that are um, uh, census-designated places. They're towns, but they're not actual incorporated cities. Huh? Or unincorporated. unincorporated cities, yeah. Unincorporated areas. When we look at the cities, we can see the number of cities here, and then there are some unincorporated areas on this map as well. North Fair Oaks, as an example, is an unincorporated area that becomes an important area in redistricting because it's probably the most densely populated Latino area in the district. When we look at the ethnic population, we can see densities of Asian and Latino voters, or Asian and Latino residents. So as an example, this is where the Asian population is. You can see some dense population concentrations here, here, and here. This population, as we discussed at the last meeting, is heavily Asian, but that Asian part is kind of broken up into a lot of it is uh, Pacific Islanders. So Hawaiian and other Guam and other, uh, so we're not talking about Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese, you know, Southeast Asian here, where we are in these communities up here. In terms of the Latino population, I mentioned that North Fair Oaks, a really dense Latino population, also dense Latino populations in a couple other parts of the district. We have this one census block group that is a large geographic area that shows to be heavily Latino, but I haven't done the, the look. It's, it might be only 100 Latinos in that area. We're over here, we're talking thousands of Latinos in population. So the, don't get mistaken by this and think that's the central focus of the Latino population in this district. It's probably a very small community. In, Another factor that really drives districting, and it will drive the conversation as we look at all these maps, is the density and the differences in areas of this district that are very dense population and are very sparsely populated. And you can see in this map, the darker areas are more densely populated, and the areas with little or no shading are very sparsely populated. And it, essentially, we could take this entire population of all this not very sparsely populated area, and we could probably fit it into that little tiny triangle in terms of raw, raw people. So that will have an impact on how we draw lines. Essentially, we'll have to answer some questions with this population as to, as to if we're going to get this population to be 140,000 people, it might right now be 120,000 short of that goal. And so how do we pair this area with some of the densely populated area in order to make districts that are of equal population size? Do we take this area and kind of carve out of this middle section here enough population to make it whole? Or do we break this area up into maybe three pieces and have it kind of bridge districts that go horizontally? So when we go through the maps, we'll see some different options that look at that. But this is a key thing to understand when you're doing districts in this area. So we've drawn three plans. Those three plans are up here on this wall. There is also a fourth plan that was, that was submitted by a member of the public. In fact, it was submitted by one of the plaintiffs. And then there was also a question about having us present essentially what could be considered a fifth plan, which is the county supervisor plan. So we have that as well um, that people can look at. Now again, getting back to my original conversation, the, yeah. Uh, you, you 
you say it's the county supervisor plan or is the county it's the existing supervisor district? It's the existing supervisor districts, okay, but so it's a it's, yeah. So they, a plan the supervisors have not come up with a plan no. for the Carver Commission. I no, no, no. Yeah. That. So this is the that map is of the existing county supervisor districts. Right. Okay. And it could be considered as an option plan for this agency. Yeah. However, one of the things that uh, we've discussed already tonight and discussed in a prior board meeting is that when we say we're drawing districts thinking about the communities of interest, the communities of interest for a vector control district or a harbor district or a school board or a county supervisor, those communities of interest can be very different. So when I draw districts for a community college, I spend a lot of time looking at the feeder campuses of all the high schools. When I draw districts for a school district, I look at where all the elementary schools and so on are. When I draw a district for uh, a water district, I'm actually just finished a water district redistricting in Solano County where we were literally mapping where the almond groves are and where the walnut groves are. So this district mapping for the harbor district doesn't care if somebody has an almond tree, but in the irrigation district they did. So when we look at the three maps that we drew, I want to draw your attention to some criteria that are used in determining kind of these things that we talked about earlier, this good redistricting principles. First off, the population. You can see that the biggest district in terms of size is overpopulated by 2,500. The smallest district by size is underpopulated by 1,800. That difference, the smallest to the largest, is right here a negative one and a positive two, so a total of 3%. The biggest to the smallest is differing only by 3%. So this gets kind of a check mark in that equal population box, right? We have equal population. In terms of ethnicity, we can look at Asian, Latino, and African American census voting age population, and we can see that we have a district here that's 53% Asian. That's that seat number one up here. We also have a couple districts with Asian population in that kind of 20%, which I would consider to be a district where the Asian population could influence the outcome of an election, which is the criteria under the CBRA. We also have a district number two here that is 23% Latino, and a district five here that is 23% Latino. One of the things that I found interesting in this plan when we first drew it was, remember how that was that in the Asian map there was a dense Asian population here? Even with that dense Asian population drawn all into the same district, this is still only an 8% Asian district because that Asian population is essentially being paired with so much population that is not heavily Asian. And there are no really adjacent Asian populations to draw it with to make a stronger Asian district there. In plan B, oh, uh, to get back to this again, this one, remember that discussion about density, we took the most densely populated area, kind of drew the district, if you were to think of it in the abstract, with a north to south around the 11280 corridor, and then this par area that's very sparsely populated, we paired it primarily with population from the center of the district. Here's a second version of the mapping where District 5 is essentially the same with that 8% Asian, 23% Latino. District 4 now essentially goes, we could call it coast to coast, bay to bay essentially here, with uh, going across. And 3 goes across as well, with 2 and 1 being a little bit more compactly drawn again. Again, the smallest district is 3% under. The largest district is 2% over. Now we're at 5% total deviation, smallest to largest, but still within our population guidelines. So we're essentially still get a check mark for equal population. We have a district now in the Asian population that's 47% Asian, and another district is district number two, which is 32% Asian. So this population came down a little bit, but this population went up significantly to make two districts that incorporate a lot of that Asian population. And again, this most Latino district is the district number five. Again, you can see this trade-off in how these districts, primarily the differences in how these districts are drawn. 
the third version, Plan C, stays with this same kind of drawing of three and four and five, but then significantly alters how districts one and two are drawn. Essentially, in district number two, we're able to take that population, an Asian population, grow it even more to 34% going up. And district number one, we're actually able to come down all the way to the harbor. Essentially, this creates a district where now, this is a conversation we had earlier on in, the, in one of the first redistricting meetings we had was, now we have the central focus of the, of the agency. This harbor, which is the primary uh, harbor for the district, and it is owned by the district, and it is now represented by two different members of the board. So it's not necessarily um, the first, second, or third criteria, but it could be considered a criteria here, or an interesting point about this version of the plan is that it allows for two of the board members to represent that port, whereas before, essentially one board member in each of these prior plans uh, represented the port. Now, when we get to the public plan, this is the first, this is the public plan that was submitted. It actually looks somewhat similar to our plan A in that it takes this question of how do we deal with this densely, po this sparsely populated area. It took a little bit more evenly throughout this uh, area to the, uh, to the east of the 280, between the 280 and the 101. What it did, interestingly, was it took a little bit more of the more affluent population from District 5 and put it in here in the sparsely populated area and made this District 5 a little bit more Latino. Remember, our Latino districts were about 23% uh, Latino here. This district is 25% Latino. This district number two up here is 48% Asian. And this district number three, which in our plan was more district number two, is 32%. So 48 and a 32% in terms of the Asian population. One thing that it does that I don't like, to be honest, is we have this population, equal population question. We have one district that's 4% above, and one district now that's 2% below. They've hit a 6% deviation, which is outside of kind of our comfort zone. There's nothing legally inappropriate. We might, not, we might find that a 6% deviation is something that the attorneys are okay with. However, kind of a traditional guideline is no greater than 5%. So a little bit of a hesitation based on that simple thing. But if the board were to decide this is the one, we could do some things to clean it up a little bit around the edges to try to fix that deviation issue. Since this is based on the census, is it conceivably possible that these maps change every 10 years? Yes. Yeah, every 10 years, the board is going to have to look at the current population number, this number. And they're going to have to ask themselves, how far out of deviation are we with our biggest district to our smallest district? And if it is a significant deviation, they're going to want to redraw these lines. Now, if they come back... Significant. Well, it's, a de it's determined by the board and the lawyers and so on. A traditional criteria would be 5%, largest to smallest. That's for like a local government. That's been something that the courts have been okay with in terms of a deviation. Congressional redistricting is one person. In 49 states, they draw congressional districts to a one-person deviation. I believe our congressional districts in California are 702,904 people. I, I kind of, I thought it was like 2% or something like that. So sometimes it's 2% higher or lower, mm -hmm. right? So that combined can be about 4 or 5%. Yeah. So sometimes they'll say, we don't want our districts to be more than 2.5% above or 2.5% yeah, below. That's, that's about the same thing as saying, I don't want it to be more than 4% above or 1% below. Uh -huh. So essentially, it's 5% deviation. But there is latitude. In fact, when I say 49 states draw congressional districts to one person, the, the, deviation, the, the exception that proves the rule, essentially, is Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Hawaii stopped drawing their districts to a one-person deviation because it created these situations where you'd have islands where you're having to go over to a different island to get population to make the congressional district work. And you'd have these disconnected they felt that it was better to have districts that are out, out of balance in terms of population that at least keep all the islands whole. So 
uh, you can draw outside of the deviation when you have a justifiable reason to do so. But every 10 years, the board should come back and look at this. These numbers get updated every 10 years. These values, they actually get updated every year. They're based on an annual average produced by the American Community Survey. So San Mateo counties, so this is the, um, the ones provided by the, the plain, one of the plaintiff's attorneys do draw essentially this idea of uh, the 101 280 corridor, and then how are we going to deal with a sparsely populated population? It takes it you know, relatively evenly from three, four, and five instead of you know, moving, coming north and taking it out of two or something. When we look at the San Mateo County Supervisor Districts, we see a couple different things. One is, how did they deal with this sparsely populated area? They took it in two chunks, here and here. District number four, instead of, the, this district number four is very different than the, than the districts that we saw. And we see they actually get to a high 28% Latino number there. District number five up here with the Asian population, they get that to a 55% number. The one thing that's a little bit odd about this district plan is the way that it dodges and dives around here a little bit. And we were actually able to take from the time that these lines were adopted where the incumbents lived at that time. And we're able to show them. And you can see, like as an example, they drew this district and it swoop around here and you've got an incumbent safely nested right in there. They were able to draw it so that every incumbent got a district. And so I'm not saying that was their primary or even second or third reason for drawing the district lines this way, but it does look like, and the conversation from the final board meeting that adopted these plans, on the last hearing, the last public meeting, they actually didn't take one of the public plans that had been provided. They submitted a new plan, a new alternate plan. This was it and it happened to preserve all the incumbents. So insofar as we might believe that the supervisor plan was essentially tweaked in order to accommodate the incumbents in that, at that time, this plan might not be, you might have to question elements of the plan and really say like, is this the right plan for the Harbor District given that it was likely kind of tweaked in order to meet the needs of the time for the county supervisors. Next steps. Yeah. Isn't your plan that you have here also uh, gives preferential to the incumbent, current incumbent on plan A? Plan A? Well, what, we can talk about it in a second. Let me just finish real quick. What we're doing right now, what we're doing right now is we're looking at these draft plans. We are uh, meeting with the Board of Supervisors, or the, with the County Harbor District, and we're trying to make sure that there's outreach. So that's why we're videotaping this. This is why we're continuing to have these hearings. The, prior to coming out with these plans, all the conversation, what we were really focused on was trying to get community of interest testimony. Now that the plans are out, we're still happy to take community of interest testimony, but we also want feedback on these actual draft plans. So if somebody has feedback like South San Francisco shouldn't be with Brisbane or you know, the, the district lines that cut across are not as preferable as the district lines that go north-south, kind of, that kind of input is constructive and helpful. So that's the end of the presentation. I'll answer your question right now about the uh, incumbents. We have, at the request of the board, put the incumbent current board members onto the maps. If you're to look at plans A, B, and C, oh, we've moved them out of order. So if you look at A, B, and C, which are the three middle plans, A draws three incumbents together in one district. And then there, is, uh, then there are two incumbents that have their own seats. So essentially you have three members, the big kind of takeaway is you have three incumbents in one district. In plan C, by coming down the coast and doing that thing about addressing whether or not two board members can both share the harbor, you do end up having a situation where now those three incumbents are broken up into two incumbents in one district and one incumbent in another. 
there are no plans that are drawn that preserve all of the incumbents. Um, that could be something that is proposed, but it hasn't been something that I've been asked to do, and it's not something that kind of came naturally as we drew these districts. Um, and these districts were drawn before we, you know, uh, took in, into account the, the incumbents. And then the uh, Sarsfield plan, again, draws three incumbents in one district. So if, there, if people are watching this on TV, this is plan A, and there are three incumbents right here. There's another incumbent here, and the fourth incumbent lives up here in South San Francisco, so, uh, close to where we're meeting right now. In plan B, three incumbents all in one district, one incumbent up here in a district, and again, this, third this fifth incumbent right there. And in the last plan, essentially the same thing with the incumbents that have seats that are to their own. And then you have two incumbents in District 1 and one incumbent in District 3. And, and to be clear, by the way, um, drawing districts to minimize the disruption of the currently elected board can be seen as respecting the existing vote of the people. It isn't necessarily seen as being a negative. So I wouldn't say as an example that the county supervisor shouldn't have drawn districts where they all preserved the incumbents because the Supreme Court and other courts have found that that can be a legitimate rationale for drawing lines. In fact, drawing lines that purposefully draw somebody out of a district is, can be seen as more kind of cancerous to the process than drawing districts that preserve incumbents. And, uh, and so when we see this question about incumbents, we want to see that maybe they're considered as one of the criteria, but they can't be considered as one of the first criteria. You can't say, we're going to do 10% deviation because we want to draw these incumbents together. It can't be considered maybe even a second or third criteria. You can't say, we're going to reduce the ethnic population in a district in order to preserve an incumbent. But it can be considered as kind of a fourth, fifth, or sixth criteria. Yeah. That's it. Any other questions? What, what area was it that there were three um, incumbents that were going to be either lose their seat? I, I couldn't quite get the whole... There's three incumbents that live out in this area, on this west western end of the district. There's three incumbents that live right there, and you can see them on the map here. Right here, this area. So, yeah. And there's no plan that preserves all the incumbent seats. It just hasn't been drawn. I haven't been asked to do it, and it didn't kind of come naturally. Uh, isn't one of the, one of the incumbents is not running for re-election, is that correct? I'm not, I'm not aware. I believe that's one that slows out there or what folks. This is more of a question that the board's going to have to address when they um, choose a final plan and also when they choose the order of the elections. Right. That's actually going to be one of the last steps they take is to determine uh, which seats are going to be which numbers and which seats are going to come up in which election cycles. And if somebody's not running for re-election, that can help kind of lubricate the process a little bit. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'd just like to point out for the benefit of everybody that over here on this table to my left, we have hard copies of uh, Paul's presentation. We have hard copies of the various maps. We have markers. We have uh, maps that also show uh, population blocks so that if somebody's fast with a uh, mental arithmetic you can start you can draw maps to try to hit those target numbers so all of this information is over here and again Paul will stick around to answer any questions as you start looking at some of this information is your plan to um, include these areas that these districts cover include um, the outreach include the specific cities, like for example, here in South San Francisco, we cover Colma and Brisbane. Is there any plan to go to specifically to these areas and try to get them to, you know, submit their maps or some way so that they can participate and know what's happening? Because I know from experience here in South San Francisco, the school districts took it upon it was uh, distributed to the schools and they made it a project and that helped and brought the kids and the community to uh, you know 
to submit their own maps, mm -hmm. and it was a project for the students. So, I mean, I'd seen very few people from our right. area, and I didn't realize that Coma was part of it, but I, th I thought that I, I would find, ask, I know that we had outreach, and we didn't get that many people, but we tried, and I'm just wondering what, what outreach you guys right. are doing. We have been trying with um, press releases, uh, direct uh, um, uh, email communications, uh, we've placed ads in newspapers. We've got uh, our website, smharbor.com, has got a section devoted to this process that includes all of the maps that we've developed to date. It offers the opportunity for people to vote for uh, the map of their preference and also to provide... Did you uh, draw one yourself? Did I draw one myself? No, I'm saying for the public to, when they go to this website, if they do they have a, a tool to participate and draw their there, own lines? There, that's, there a, is, that's what we did in some Yeah, there is, there is not a tool on the website to draw maps, but we, as I said, we've got now this map that has all of the data points to help somebody if they wanted to draw a map or to just simply adjust one of the maps that Paul has uh, prepared. Is there an address where you may have to send it in? or? Um, if you draw a map, you can send it. I think our physical mailing address is on the website. Yeah. Uh, yes. And also well, this. Uh, give it to us, or if you don't, you know, I'm just saying, you know, oh. somebody, because if we had maps, then we could bring it to the city clerk's office. Yes. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said uh, earlier that our website is smharbor.com. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 1449. El Granada. One four four nine. El Granada. Nine four zero one eight. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the maps that, that are here, the mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. in the packet and also mm -hmm. here. Oh, that's in there? Um, but this yeah. is a map yeah. that so I've just received that has yeah. no idea. And I think at this point then, while the public looks at the maps and uh, asks questions individually of Paul, uh, we'll turn off the video, we'll thank everybody who's been watching this, we'll be repeating this process again tomorrow evening at 6.30. Uh, the district offices, 504 Avenue, Alhambra, in Albanada. Thank you. So this has the um, population. Um, it's also on the map beyond, on the wall. Mm -hmm. I can't. Population of the